Welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you and many of our uh, attendees that are on our webcast uh, to the first seminar in a new seminar series started by the TCG project. This is the TCG seminar series on technologies for a resilient power grid. I'll just take a minute to talk about TCG and the seminar series for those who are not familiar with it and then introduce our speaker for the day. So uh, TCG is a research center, trustworthy cyber infrastructure for power grid that is funded by the Department of Energy and Department of Homeland Security. Partner institutions include University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, Washington State University, Dartmouth College, and University of California at Davis. Uh, this center follows on the heels of the TSEP Center that was funded by the National, Foundation, National Science Foundation with support from DOE and DHS. Uh, TSEP has ended recently, and now we have uh, started TCG a few months ago. So uh, the seminar series that we started is to sort of uh, discuss what the requirements and technologies are needed to enable uh, reliable, safe operations in the power grid and to essentially realize uh, resilience overall. So it is my pleasure to now introduce the first speaker of the series, uh, Professor Manimaran Govindrasu from Iowa State. Uh, we, we welcome him to here, here to Urbana, and he'll be talking to us today about cyber physical system security, risk modeling, and mitigation. Uh, professor Govindrasu is currently an associate professor and director of student professional development in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Iowa State University. He is affiliated with the industry funded Electric Power Research Center and the National Science Foundation funded Information Assurance Center. Uh, he has received a Research Faculty Award in 2003 and an Outstanding Engineering Faculty Award in 2009, both at Iowa State. He has published over 100 papers and participated in uh, uh, many events and given uh, key lectures and seminars. More recently, he contributed to the Department of Energy NASPINET Specification Project and is currently Chair of the Cybersecurity Task Force at IEEE Power and Energy Systems CAMP Subcommittee. Uh, without further ado, I welcome Professor Gobind Rasu. Okay, please. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Himanshu, for the wonderful uh, introduction, also for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Pete uh, Sawyer for uh, inviting me to come here and give uh, some of my research uh, results uh, to share with you. I always um, view you know, Urbana Champagne, our research education at Urbana Champagne at a higher level is one of the best place to do research and uh, conduct uh, education and all great things. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk about uh, cyber security, my background now, uh, cyber system, primarily my PhD. I have been associated with the power system researchers for almost a decade now. I bring some sort of uh, unique aspect in the cyber physical system that is what I'm going to share with you hopefully I try to cover uh, both side of the uh, research aspects to some extent so in this particular talk I'm going to cover uh, risk modeling and mitigation uh, you will hear shortly what I mean by that so the outline of my talk is uh, organized as follows I'm going to give some introduction about uh, power system, cyber physical system, what are the potential cyber attacks, uh, potential attacks. Then I'm going to talk about risk modeling framework and take two case studies to show that particular modeling concept. Uh, one in the intrusion type of attacks and what are the consequences, uh, especially the intrusion into a substation of a power grid. Another example I'm going to talk about uh, data integrity attacks uh, on a wide area control system. Uh, the, those are the two case studies. Then at the end, I'm going to cover the SCADA security test bed we have developed at Iowa State, uh, share a few experience there. Then I, at the end, I will conclude this talk. Just to give you a quick introduction to power system, what is power system or electric power grid? So if you look at, there are three elements in the power system. One is the power generation, transmission, distribution. Those are the three things. Those are the physical infrastructure you see every day. Uh, uh, the, the bulk power system refers to the generation and transmission. That is what the bulk power system, the NERC 
compliance, network reliability criteria, all those things apply to the bulk power system. Then you have the distribution system in which you know residential load, commercial load, industrial customer and so on, those are all connected. Then the new things like uh, renewable generation, distributed generation, they are all integrated into the power grid using power electronics devices. Those are all new things that is happening in the smart grid environment. This is a good picture from the physical part, that is what you see at the bottom. Then what you see on the top is basically the communication, control and computation, which collectively forms the cyber aspect of the system. So the cyber system is integral part of the modern power grid. Uh, so what I mean by that, uh, if you look at uh, the transmission control center, yeah, the energy management system or generation management system or distribution management system or various uh, network application that are run on power control centers in the power system, they use all kinds of measurements collected in the field. They are sent through the communication network and processed at the control center. Then the decisions or the actual controls go back to the physical system. So it is sort of a feedback control system wherein some feedback things are automated, some are uh, basically operator assisted. Okay, that's why it is called SCADA control system and so on. So this gives you a nice uh, introduction about the cyber physical aspect of the system. So let us get into the United States power grid. This is taken from NERC uh, website. It is a massive infrastructure. Geographically, it is massive infrastructure. There are several interconnections, especially Western interconnection, Eastern interconnection, Aircart, and one in uh, Canada, four interconnections, they are there they are connected. But you see what here, there are so many reliability coordination uh, activities. There is a Midwest uh, uh, reliability organization, uh, Western reliability organization. There are certain reliability criteria has to be established in each of those reliability coordination uh, area. And within those co coordination area, you have what is known as you know, balancing authorities, uh, which manage you know, uh, power between uh, different control areas. I will come to this picture, but I just want to convey to you it is a massive infrastructure with a complex interaction among various uh, control uh, control areas and also various regions. I, I think that is important. It is not isolated thing. Uh, uh, it is an intercon interconnected system. Let us come to uh, from the IT perspective or ICT perspective how a typical SCADA control network looks like. So you have uh, three key building blocks. One is the substation. Uh, it could be a transmission substation or generation uh, power plant substation or distribution substation. Then you have the control center. Associated with the control center, so many substations are connected. Each of the substation itself is a highly automated system. Substation automation in, is in place, which has you know, its own local area network data concentrators, several RTUs or IEDs, those are connected, then various kind of computational uh, functions are performed. Uh, from the uh, communication perspective, they are all, uh, there is dial-up connection, there are sometimes wireless, sometimes uh, VPN, those kind of access may be provided to these substations. Uh, they basically have firewalls, some sort of access control, depending upon the substation, how modern it is. So some sort of security elements are also put in place. Then you have a wide area communication, that's how uh, the data acquisition information is sent. Uh, then the decision is made at the control center. Uh, the control action comes back through the wide area network. Control center itself has you know, a wide infrastructure, local area network, various servers, EMS, DM, uh, whatever, uh, depending upon uh, different kind of application database servers and so on, there could be firewall. So it is a complex uh, communication, computation involved uh, infrastructure with the security elements embedded into it. There are other kinds of uh, application like power markets or some other uh, non-real-time applications may be running. Those are all connected to the control center to get uh, the real data to estimate, plan and uh, analyze. Those are all interconnected again. So there is a communication element, there are computation, uh, there is sensing, all those things happening. But the question here is, what happens somebody gets into a substation, penetrating through a firewall, logging into a server there, trying to disrupt the physical equipment that are there as part of the substation. Maybe uh, 
uh, opening all the breakers for example isolate this substation from the rest of the grid those are the potential uh, cyber actions or hacking action possible uh, but if at all such action happens what are the consequences on the power grid that is one kind of uh, attack scenario i am going to describe uh, so let us go and look at uh, take a moment i will come to that uh, this is just uh, give an idea how important this particular problem uh, this data is from uh, cert uh, which is a database maintained by us government for uh, collection of all uh, uh, vulnerabilities that are reported in cyber based systems uh, what do you see here is over a period of time uh, the number of vulnerabilities keep uh, growing because more and more automation happens more and more open interoperability all those things uh, coming up and those are good things but they also expose more vulnerabilities so uh, it is a growing uh, concern more vulnerability they have to be addressed to so let us look at are they these vulnerabilities are in fact a threat to the system i want to quote a few uh, statements from various uh, sources one is from critical infrastructure protection report uh, re uh, prepared by uh, general accounting office uh, basically it says uh, it was in 2004 there has been growing recognition that control systems are now vulnerable to cyber attacks from numerous sources including hostile government terrorist group disgruntled employees and other malicious intruders uh, that is uh, six years ago there are several other reports uh, uh, basically state the same thing even in recent times uh, but there is another data that was published in 2010 uh, ris si incident report uh, this basically uh, actual incidents that have happened uh, the industrial cyber system it uh, looks at various uh, sectors uh, not just power grid but it could be now water distribution uh, oil and natural pipeline system and so on other critical infrastructure so the cyber incidents have been stable uh, but they are expected to rise especially if you look at power and utility industries in the last 5 years 13 reported incidents some cases no incidents were not reported there might have been more incidents than 13 13 reported incidents which is a 30 percent increase from the previous five years uh, th that is the trend there is another re similar report just uh, published mcafe report uh, the title is given there you can google search and get that report they show similar uh, data points uh, to show this uh, trend of cyber incidents are improving those data were collected uh, from uh, the executives of those critical infrastructures uh, let me get into the type of attack so that now we have some idea what type of attack cyber attacks we are talking about how we can uh, mitigate them and so on so the attacks themselves of uh, different type one can think of attacks could be protocol type of attacks uh, the communication protocols that are used in power grid could be under attack like dnp or iccp or modbus whatever protocol that may be other type of attacks could be intrusion intrusion into a substation remotely manned substation or uh, other type of substation or into a control center or into any other critical cyber asset uh, one can get intrude and create you no know, uh, some sort of uh, undesired action in the power system that could lead to another action another action potentially could lead to uh, uh, some sort of uh, cascading event if it is not properly prevented or mitigated and if the system doesn't have enough resiliency to take care then the other one is most common thing which is reported in recent time is the internet worms or malware those kind of things many times these malware they target microsoft products uh, and many of the industries they use microsoft products uh, they happen to affect uh, power utilities then denial of service is the massive uh, bombardment of uh, network resources uh, by flooding packets or exhausting server cpu cycles any such thing or denial of service attack those attacks do have impact on the operation of uh, power grid so uh, with respect to this particular system what i am going to do uh, since it is a cyber physical system i want to make a distinction uh, in terms of attack being brute force attack or intelligent attack brute force attack is the one okay somebody is very knowledgeable about cyber system hacked into something uh, just you know did something but that person doesn't know 
the operation of the power system the intelligent attacker is another type of attacker uh, who not only uh, hacked into the system but also knows the operation of the power grid how the power system operates what is the uh, event he or she can cause in the system to maximize the impact or damage so uh, that uh, intelligent attacker need not be a single person it could be a collection of people one person is knowledgeable in cyber security other person is knowledgeable in power grid they can work together to create an intelligent attack uh, the point here is uh, the attacks themselves could be isolated attack just happens in an isolated way or it could happen in a coordinated way multiple events happening simultaneously targeting multiple uh, critical elements so that uh, uh, it creates you no know, uh, maximum uh, uh, damage to the system operation so uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you some example of intelligent attack uh, that is uh, uh, how a uh, attacker who is knowledgeable over power system can uh, create uh, disturbance in the system so this is about the defense just one slide i want to mention uh, a comprehensive defense mechanism should include prevention the occurrence of uh, cyber incident attack incident should be uh, prevented uh, then there has to be mechanism to detect then uh, mitigate uh, if it happens then tolerance attack tolerance is a very very important thing that is where the resiliency come into picture the system should have a sufficient resiliency even to withstand attack and self feel from such an attack so if you are, if you have to do a risk assessment process how secure the environment right now uh, with respect to various uh, attack threats one has to define the system model uh, the attacker model what kind of attack uh, that is being modeled here uh, then perform risk assessment do sensitive analysis of the whole model if the system is found to be uh, below the acceptable Uh, threshold of the risk then basically or higher risk for that matter then it has to be uh, hardened with the security features so security investment so one can develop a mathematical quantitative framework do to perform a uh, risk based analysis including cost benefit analysis uh, kind of thing uh, but there are several unknowns there are not enough data to Uh, justify every aspect but this uh, model could be very useful uh, in the nerc sip process also risk assessment is one of the important thing uh, i think that is important then uh, when you look at from real time or online perspective uh, there has to be online monitoring mechanisms whether anomaly detection engine or other kind of things they could detect no intrusions uh, integrity data integrity or file integrity whatever forms also detect uh, denial of service attacks those kind of form then perform what if an uh, scenario analysis there may be so many events happening cyber related malicious events in the system but every event need not be of critical to the system operation uh, one can ignore some of the events because the number of events are too many to handle so that's where the what if scenario analysis to see if this event does occur in the system or likely to occur what will be the resulting consequence in the power system in terms of losing loss, losing the load or equipment damage or economic loss whatever that may be that is where the risk modeling come into picture if it is highly risky even then it has to be mitigated that's where real time mitigation so it is a ongoing thing in the system it may be uh, done at different time scale depending upon the uh, subsystem that is being monitored and controlled so this is what uh, shown as a flow chart uh, uh, where you see you know various cyber physical cyber assets are being monitored also physical assets based on that some anomaly detection happens correlating information from various sources and see uh, connecting to the dots so things are happening in what form uh, if uh, is there any credible likely events then do you perform a what if uh, scenario analysis and see the effect if it is a high risk event when i say likelihood times the impact that is what the risk then that event should be uh, mitigated so the mitigation could be immediately initiated or after seeing the impact uh, the point here is the mitigation is not just a cyber based mitigation alone uh, the mitigation could be power based mitigation so it has to be a combination of cyber and power mitigation depending upon the type of uh, scenario we are talking about Uh, like you no know, things like uh, 
uh, the access control or intrusion tolerance or honey pots those are some of the cyber related mitigation measures maybe uh, doing some um, uh, generation shift or uh, uh, controlled islanding those kind of things are power related measures so depending upon the severity of the attack and uh, uh, the impact uh, one or more such te uh, techniques uh, may have to be used in conjunction so i'm going to talk about uh, quickly one example uh, case study now that is a risk modeling intrusion attacks uh, this is uh, uh, this paper was published uh, a couple of years ago uh, if you are interested you can look at this particular citation in the IEEE digital library so what we are talking about is the scenario i mentioned before uh, some hacker uh, gets into a substation automation system, intrudes into the substation automation system. Uh, let us assume the substation has firewall followed by servers. Uh, so the hacker need to penetrate through the firewall, then get into the computer system, then tries to do some control actions, such as opening the breakers. So what is the likelihood of that event happening, and what is the impact? That's what uh, uh, I'm going to talk about. So what is the process involved in doing this uh, uh, hacking, uh, especially with the intrusion type of attack? The, these are the typical steps. It is a methodical steps. So this is a very tedious process. There are a lot of uh, open source software tools available to aid the hacker in performing some of these tasks. One is you know, footprinting. Uh, the, this is basically identifying the security posture of the organization or uh, infrastructure to find out okay what are the locations of the substation control centers what are the ip address used email addresses or phone numbers those kind of things gathering information then scanning scanning one can now uh, try to scan dial the numbers to see what uh, uh, where is the wireless access point vpn connection what type of connection what kind of communication protocols used and so on then enumerating all open ports what are the ports open uh, then trying to uh, establish a login uh, using uh, password guess guessing uh, tools, uh, dictionary or brute force or social engineering. So what I'm saying is footprinting, scanning, enumeration, those are the steps that are typically followed. There are tools available to aid the process. Then if uh, the attacker is lucky, uh, the person exploits the system. Uh, so that, uh, but uh, we don't want the hacker to be successful in this effort. Uh, once uh, the intrusion happens in the cyber world, set an action to be performed. Uh, for this particular modeling, I'm going to assume the action performed is opening all the breakers in a given substation, whatever that was intruded. So the cyber physical model involves two steps or two aspects. Only the cyber modeling that is. Uh, uh, that is based on stochastic patternet. I'm going to create a stochastic patternet, patternet of the cyber system and uh, associated security features based on which I'm going to compute what is the steady state probabilities. The steady state probability will give me what is the likelihood of uh, this attack happening in this particular substation. Then once I know that number, then I'm going to create that scenario into the power system using power flow simulation as if you know, this substation is taken off from, uh, from the power system topology and see what is the impact it has in terms of you know, serving the load and other things. Uh, that is where the simulation part comes. So the first part is a, uh, modeling, that is a cyber system using stochastic patternet. The later part is you know, uh, using power flow simulation. Uh, we compute the uh, probability on the top. We compute the impact from the bottom simulation, then we multiply these two to get the risk, okay? So what we do is we, uh, the flow chart, what you see on the left this is the methodical process that is used to uh, go through this thing, uh, but it has to be done for every access point in the system, every vulnerable access point or every access point in the system, then you enumerate all those things and determine the overall risk of the system. So that's where we use this hierarchical approach where you first compute the access point vulnerability. Each access point, you compute the probability of this event happening multiplied by the impact that the event created. So that is what your vulnerability index or risk index. Then from access point vulnerability, you create scenario vulnerability. Then you have several such scenarios enumerated in the system you compute the system vulnerability, which is the maximum among all those risk indices. Uh, then if you see the risk index is high, 
then the system is uh, uh, basically, you know, the current uh, security is not adequate. It has to be improved upon. So this is the hierarchical framework we use. Uh, but uh, uh, let me give the detail, a little bit detail about the calculation of uh, the probability of this event occurring, also the impact. So the stochastic pertinent model, I'm just going to model this uh, substation. Each substation will be having something of this nature, slight variations. There is a firewall followed by two computer system. For an hacker to be successful, firewall has to be penetrated and one of these computers have to be uh, uh, successfully logged down. Uh, so for that, you create uh, some sort of uh, petinet. It's a little bit simplified model. So uh, the, this is the token. Uh, that is where it starts. There is a transition probabilities uh, with the certain rates. Some rules, you know, firewall rules are associated with each rule. Uh, some rules will allow some packet. Some rules will deny that packet. Uh, so if successfully the person passed through based on certain rule, uh, the hacker goes here, then tries to log into the computer, whether in computer one or computer two. Uh, there is a, these are all uh, time-based rates. So it takes some time to for this process with a certain probability. Uh, the rates are very important for this model to work. Uh, transition probabilities are important. One needs data to validate these kind of models. Uh, so I will briefly mention how we got the data. Uh, otherwise, it's very hard to justify some of these models uh, 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 without real data. So if you translate this petinet into a uh, basically Markov kind of chain, uh, something like that. This is what uh, different states are there. The transition matrix will look like. Then when you solve this thing using standard packages uh, for the stochastic petinet, it will give steady state probability. What is the probability that the attacker uh, basically going to some state here or some place here? That means successfully intruded the uh, firewall, then went into one of this computer. So, so that probability is really important. Based on that, uh, we enumerate those uh, likely scenarios. Uh, as far as uh, how these uh, transition rates are computed, those are basically the total number of packets and how many packets that particular rule allowed it to go through the firewall. Uh, so for every rule, you can do those kind of calculation. That's why you associate the rate. Similarly, for the one which was denied. So the question here is, how did you find the number of packets that you uh, basically f went through this rule and what is the total number of packets. So you need some data to fill this uh, value to get this probability value. So we try to acquire the data. Unfortunately, nobody would like to share this kind of information. Either it's not available or they don't want to share it. So what we did was we approached the IT department in Iowa State University. After uh, some explanation, they shared the data with us. Based on that, we populated our model with the real data and analyzed it. I want to mention it is not an industrial control system. It is not a SCADA system. It is a university system. Some of the uh, login failed attempt. A student, no, by mistake, made that attempt. Uh, that may be counted as a uh, malicious event in our data. So there is some uh, imprecision in the actual data. But uh, the point is to validate the model to convince it is indeed a valid model. So same way, one can do the password uh, model uh, for the password guessing what is the rate at which the system responds. Uh, one important feature when we are do, trying to model these things, one needs to also take into account uh, mitigation. If such thing happens, how do you mitigate? One simple mitigation what we did in as part of the model is lockout feature. Somebody attempts two or three times to log into a computer, then it will log off basically shut down the login itself for few minutes or few seconds, whatever. That can be modeled. That means you throttle the rate at which the attacker is uh, attempting to penetrate into the system. Same way in the firewall also, one can do the same thing. Uh, the firewall rules can be dynamically configured so that subsequent packets don't penetrate through the firewall. So basically, one can uh, basically include the mitigation strategies also into the model. Uh, that's what uh, I want to point out. The mitigation could be multiple levels. Then that is what. Uh, so b then we solve this model. I will show you the complex model uh, using the standard packages. We compute the steady state probability for a certain event happening. Then the impact we create that event in the power flow simulation. The impact factor is nothing but what is the total load 
uh, basically that is in the denominator loss of load due to this particular substation uh, disconnected. So, we start with L uh, that is in the power L equal to 1 uh, when slowly we increase whenever the power flow diverges we stop there that is basically uh, the value for L and we basically compute uh, the gamma factor or impact factor. So, then we basically compute the risk. I want to point out the system what we took for our study is IEEE 30 bus system which has know about uh, 24 substations. Uh, they are connected to a control center. Each substation has uh, some configuration of that nature I showed you from the cyber security point of view. Some slight variations we also account in that they are shown in different colors. Uh, so, so from our study, this is the big model of the Petinet. From our study, we realized that uh, substation 19 happened to be the most uh, uh, impact or basically has the highest vulnerability index or risk index uh, because it is a very important substation in that analysis. Uh, so different substations have different impact. When we say impact, I, I quantify in terms of loss of load, how much load lost due to this substation being uh, compromise. Uh, this may be a generation substation, high uh, generation substation possibly. Uh, the password lockout I mentioned, okay, if somebody attempts three or four times, you lock out. We set the threshold to be three, so that means you throttle the attack rate in the system. That does have impact on the uh, likelihood. The impact is still same, but the likelihood of event happening is going to be drastically reduce. Uh, so, you, what you see in the shaded portion is the vulnerability index that was computed including the simple mitigation scheme. Of course, if you include like a dynamic uh, firewall ruling uh, rule uh, definition and so on, then it can further bring down the likelihood scenario and overall risk index also can come into picture. So, the point here is uh, risk modeling can integrate the mitigation into it uh, and make the system uh, robust. So, this is another result in that context. Uh, I want to make another statement, final statement about this particular modeling. Uh, so far, I focused on uh, individual or isolated attacks, the, but the attacks could be coordinated. Typically, you know, cyber attacks or any terrorist related attacks, they are all coordinated. So, they target multiple uh, physical systems or cyber systems simultaneously. So, for example, this is a power system, simple power system. If you want to disrupt this target load at the bottom, so, what you need to do is you need to disturb this line and this line which needs coordination. It has to be affected some substation connected here and some substation connected here. Both have to be simultaneously targeted. So, one can uh, do some joint probability those kind of calculation to get same risk analysis and mitigation. But the interesting thing I want to point out a smart attacker will analyze the topology of the power system and see what are the critical elements. And one important thing they can do is, if I do something uh, affect this one, the system will inherently try to recover from that fault. So, they, it may have some sort of you know, defense mechanism to overcome. If you go and attack the defense mechanism, first level defense mechanism, then the second level defense mechanism will kick in to uh, try to mitigate the situation, you attack that also. So, if you look at from your coordinator, most sophisticated smart attacker would do is, attack the most critical element, also associated first level defense, second level defense, then you form it as a coordinated attack that could have serious impact potentially you know, cascading outage. So, we have some results on that aspect, but uh, it was not yet published, so I did not present it here. Let me go to the second case study. Uh, this is about data integrity attacks. Uh, this is going to be on the wide area control, not on the substation or control center, but on the wide area communication channel. Uh, this was presented at the PES general meeting uh, panel session uh, uh, just a uh, couple of months ago. Uh, just to look at uh, architecturally, uh, the power system uh, SCADA network works like this. You have a substation, you have a control center, some data equation goes one way, uh, decision making happens here, then control goes back, right? So, let us assume substation is not, uh, uh, nobody can hack the substation, it is highly protected, secure. Similarly, control center is highly prote protected and secure. Uh, but the communication network could be secure as well, uh, but one can create you know, huge uh, 
uh, flooding based attack using you no know, honey pots or uh, bot nets for example sorry bot nets one can basically flood this network and slow down the scada control communication which means it will have uh, impact on the physical operation system so i want to emphasize scada control system it is a control system it is not an it system control systems have dynamics they have feedback loop they have timing requirements with respect to communication and control so uh, if you look at from the control theoretic perspective so you have a plant that is a power power system to be controlled power plant has a sensors and actuators the sensor senses something send it to the controller which makes the decision uh, similarly the, once a controller makes some decision it basically controls through some actuation on the physical system it goes on that's what the system power system also does but uh, somebody introduces a delay in the forward path or backward path through creating some sort of uh, uh, man in the middle or flooding based attack that basically will delay this communication the stability of the system could potentially be affected so the man in the middle attack could be of different form i will show you in the next slide uh, this is the conceptual diagram you have the cyber system you have the physical system here uh, some sensing of the phys cyber uh, basically physical system is made some decision is made then control is applied this is, goes on so what happens the sensing signal could be disturbed two kind of disruption possible data integrity attack that means that signal value could be corrupted or modified if it is not encrypted or it could be completely interrupted that packet could be completely denied not letting it go further or it could be replicated you uh, uh, send a fake spurious packet or replay the packet old packet at much later point of time because these data are time sensitive so it will make a wrong decision if any of those things happens then same thing can be done on a control signal you can do uh, integrity attacks uh, denial of service or replay attack whatever that may be so it turned out the control signals uh, attack is more impactful than uh, the signal itself uh, but this will have the physical system but the point i want to make uh, when you get a signal from a power system the operator or the associated logic in the control center knows oh these are the expected value this is the range acceptable the moment the range uh, the actual value exceeds the range or goes out of the range then it will be suspicious oh there is something is going on uh, we have to uh, investigate but a smart attacker what uh, he or she would do basically try to stay within that bound the range will be still complied the data value but artificially creating uh, some sort of you no know, ramp function or different combination one can create attacks it looks like a legitimate data but it is an attack which will have uh, impact on the physical system so i am going back to the same diagram we started with uh, because i am going to look at the different control areas as you see these small bubbles those are control areas each control area basically uh, balances uh, supply and demand within its own control region basically it generates power to supply its load sometimes it basically provides Uh, power to neighboring uh, control centers through tie lines okay so this is called uh, so the point i am making here is there are lot of such uh, control areas in the us power grid uh, there is a communication between them power sharing between those control area so i am going to talk about automatic generation control in this context so let us take uh, two areas uh, area 1 power system area 2 power system two area they change flow for example some power is going from here to there uh, there to here that is the tie line power flow uh, this is basically scheduled interchange between control areas it's uh, common agreed upon uh, what is being measured by this uh, sensing or communication thing is frequency and uh, tie line measurement these are two important measurements for the uh, control algorithm what is the frequency of this control area what is the uh, tie line flow that is going this way similarly this measure how much the tie line flows go here what is the frequency here then based on this measurement it basically computes uh, what control action whether generation has to be increase or decrease ramp up or ramp down that is a control action it is done so i am going to show an example through a data integrity attack uh, this measurement is coming from cyber system somebody manipulates this tie line measurement or frequency measurement that will result in the agc taking a wrong decision 
uh, may, maybe for example uh, whenever you should not uh, increase the generation it will end up in increasing the generation that will result in increasing the frequency of the overall system exceeding the NERC uh, reliability criteria uh, that will eventually lead to problems in the uh, system that's what I'm going to show uh, this is the AGC algorithm as I said before AGC uh, algorithm takes tie line power uh, flow as the measurement input also frequency as a measurement input it computes uh, what is known as area control error uh, based on the area control error then it determines ramp up or ramp down the generation associated with that particular control area how much generation increase or decrease uh, in that control area needs to be performed then those actions are physically applied on the power grid so what do you see in this flow chart some are cyber this dotted uh, arrows are cyber related communication where the physical things are actual uh, physical action that are happening in the power. So we are talking about somebody disrupting, modifying through data integrity attack this tie line measurement or frequency measurement. So let us take an example. What is what is the area control error? Area control error, as I said, what is the scheduled interchange between control area and actual interchange? The actual interchange and scheduled interchange they should be same. In other words, area control error should be zero. If it is above or below zero, positive or negative accordingly uh, generation has to be increase or decrease that's what uh, the logic uh, the point is here is the frequency whatever the tie line flow and the frequency they have to comply that is very very important so for a certain tie line flow only certain frequencies uh, matching arbitrary frequency won't match it's a pair they always go in pair which means a smart attacker should know what is that pair He's simply saying some arbitrary frequency then the operator or the system will detect oh these are not consistent they have to be consistent obeying the physical law of the power system so for a given net power, uh, tie line flow corresponding uh, frequency measurement is there let us assume the knowledgeable attacker knows that exact quantity and does both uh, so for example this is the typical scenario that happen in a two area control system uh, what is being load increase in area two let us take two areas area one and area two load increase in area two that means uh, the power flow more power flow has to go to area two because to serve those load uh, which means area the frequency of the system will go down frequency as the system goes down means some action needs to be taken which is basically increase the generation to basically match and bring the frequency back to uh, 60 hertz so there are various scenarios that could happen in this two area system and each of those cases what are the required control actions that is uh, performed uh, so due to lack of time i skip these things but this is what the agc algorithm does so we took a simple uh, two area system to illustrate this concept uh, what uh, so let us assume the tie line flow that was uh, agreed is uh, 0.4 per unit from area one to area two uh, of course the frequency deviation should be zero to start with so the attacker smart attacker would do okay the frequency is this much as opposed to no actual frequency show this frequency and the corresponding tie line flow is the 0.4 decreasing this much so we'll make the agc in control area think that oh we i need to increase the generation so it will go and increase the generation due to which the overall net frequency of the system will go from 60 to 60.156 which is basically much beyond the acceptable limit of the NERC guidance so frequency oscillation violating frequency uh, characteristics uh, quite possible that will lead to other actions similarly frequency can be decreased depending upon how the attacker created so this is the before attack and after attack uh, so one can disturb the control signal that way uh, the good news is there are uh, mitigation measures what can put in place even if the smart attacker tries to do that what is the mitigation uh, uh, thing when you see this uh, arbitrary change in the frequency power system doesn't uh, change in frequency so rapidly the power system does have a inertia so this inertia has to follow okay it cannot rapidly decrease like the person is uh, talking about it has to decrease obeying certain uh, equation which is basically you know rate of change of frequency which is based on the inertia that information is not publicly available only the power system uh, operator the system engineer knows about it that information can be plugged into the 
anomaly detection engine okay this is changing too rapidly ignore those measurements that comes from then you investigate or operator makes uh, some intelligent decision the point here is there are mitigation measures to attack uh, prevent this kind of attacks so the final few minutes i will take to talk about the scale at security test bed we have developed uh, so this is a very simple test bed it is nowhere comparable to big test beds like a national scale at test bed in uh, national labs and so on but this is a very university scale test bed where we can demonstrate cyber physical system concept so what you have is a control center which has you no know, primary backup hot standby there is a wide area network two substation each substation has you no know, uh, relays uh, substation automation system some load connected to it uh, there is a security device that basically uh, establishes vpn connection between substation and control center this environment we have we can create uh, man in the middle attack here and see what is the consequence on the actual power load we have you no know, bulb connected it will basically disturb the uh, power basically so this is the control center it is a industry grade software uh, from siemens power uh, spectrum power tg uh, that's what we have this is the substation uh, again from siemens sicam uh, substation with relays that's what we have uh, this is the security device the bottom what you see small device is the security device so we did a lot of uh, testing uh, of the functional capability of this particular test bed it is a very uh, tedious process to develop this test bed make this uh, hardware software all work together uh, cyber uh, related element also relays and other hardware device it is uh, quite challenging and several undergraduate students and graduate students jointly worked on this project so remotely open and close the breaker integrated resistive load uh, to the relay real time current measurements over current relay tripping the relay when uh, the current exceeds the threshold and so on then coming to the security related testing we did a lot of uh, uh, standard tools in nmap voice shark those kind of things we did the man in the middle attack i described uh, data integrity denial of control those kind of attack and how it affected the system operation those are all working but this is nowhere now uh, near to national scale test bed and we would like to enhance this system capability with uh, realistic scenarios where we can study for example we want to do hardware in the loop system level simulation we want to create a large system in our power system some of them are actual hardware some of their simulation putting together doing realistic system studies we want to do integration with a real time digital simulator which acts like a power system we want to do that then we want to expand this test bed with uh, virtualization technology so that multiple uh, substations can be created and we want to conduct advanced attacks just to conclude uh, we do several activities in this area at iowa state not just myself iowa state has a good uh, information assurance also electric power research program other professors involved uh, some form or other uh, my research has been risk modeling mitigation uh, some real time mitigation also test bed uh, design and evaluation we haven't worked a whole lot in anomaly detection except that uh, some of the schemes we incorporated into the mitigation itself uh, to conclude uh, cyber security of electric power grid, grid is uh, of a great importance to national security and uh, economic vitality of the nation uh, smart attacks with coordinated uh, behavior could have severe impacts if they are not properly mitigated there are different forms they could be created uh, denial of service data integrity or intrusion base or protocol base or worms malware those kind of thing uh, cyber physical system security is an important area warranty that's what i try to communicate uh, in this talk uh, attack prevention mitigation uh, and tolerance is important the counter measures have to be uh, joined uh, from cyber and physical systems uh, last slides uh, Uh, as i said critical infra infrastructure security is of national need not just power grid transportation water distribution system they all use cada type of control system the physical system is different but the communication control is similar capabilities the us government has no perfect uh, citizen initiative which talks about this uh, particular uh, topic uh, the importance of such topic and uh, rnt uh, education that area uh, so 
lot of uh, education and workforce development is important, a lot of uh, national agencies like DOE, NSF, NERC, THS, and NIST, they all focus on uh, cyber security in smart grid or power grid, some form or other. Synergy between university, national lab, and industry is uh, very critical in this particular area. Uh, before uh, thanking you, I would like to thank and acknowledge the contribution of uh, several of my collaborators. Professor Chen Ching Liu, who used to be at Iowa State, is right now at uh, University College Dublin. He undertakes similar research at Dublin. We are collaborating uh, through international partnership. Uh, Chi Vi Tan, who was a graduate student, right now is a faculty at uh, Michigan Tech University. And uh, three of my current graduate students, they are all part of this effort. I thank them. Uh, finally, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening to my presentation. I would be happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll start with a question. Thank you, Manimaran. That was a great talk, and I think uh, we couldn't have chose a better one to start a seminar series. You guided us to the introductory concepts of taxonomies to fairly advanced ways of doing things, and finally to test beds, which are a big challenge in this area. Uh, my one question is going back to your initial slides on risk modeling of uh, this uh, proactive versus reactive, and uh, sort of an you know, underlying idea that you need some protection and then some monitoring. And I think they have different costs and overhead associated with them, but in some ways it's, uh, you know, it's not possible to get true security without both. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on what kind of monitoring is effective and really needed in these systems and, you know, uh, and what should be done in that area. Yeah, that's a great question actually. Uh, it has to be a combination of uh, protection. That means uh, you have some safeguards in the system to tolerate or mitigate some level of uh, cyber attacks or threats. But at the same time, you need to have online mechanism. You, you, you can't really anticipate every possible attack scenarios or attack sources. Every day, no new uh, attacks are being generated. So that's where no real-time monitoring uh, that comes into picture. So it has to be a combination of protective and real-time monitoring and mitigation. Uh, th th I think that is uh, technically is the right thing to do. But the question is, uh, what is the cost associated? Uh, obviously, it is going to cost more. Uh, but if it is the right thing, that has to be done. Uh, but the important point is, uh, in addition to the cost, is the overhead. Overhead associated with some real-time monitoring those kind of activities. They should not uh, impede into the real-time characteristics of the SCADA network. That is very, very important. So using commodity off the shelf, uh, security technologies in such an environment may not be a good solution because it may take a longer time uh, to basically do some encryption function or some other authentication or some other computation that may affect real-time performance. So to answer your question, I don't know exactly what is the cost, uh, direct dollar cost associated, but the interesting thing is both has to be important as part of the comprehensive solution. But uh, when we are designing, online tools for monitoring or doing uh, various analysis, it has to be kept in mind. They have to be lightweight, and they should not affect the real-time operation. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Hi there, I'm Michael LeMay, one of our Carl Gunter's students. And um, I like this uh, discussion about the coordinated attacks, and you talked about how you can kind of indirectly, or attackers can indirectly induce um, control actions that could uh, potentially destabilize the grid. And uh, we've done some uh, work on uh, load control operations, and one of the uh, unique features of those is that they can very quickly introduce changes in the, the load on the grid, and if you were able to attack a large number of advanced meters and cause all of them to say, you know, turn on or off air conditioners all at the same time, mm -hmm. you could potentially get a very drastic um, load fluctuation. And we've read some papers that have suggested that that could have a really bad effect on the grid. So have you done any modeling or looked at any models that um, really explore in detail those sorts of large-scale load change effects? Yeah, that's a good question again. Uh, yesterday I was at um, Argonne National Laboratory. There were uh, similar discussions okay. 
what happens in the residential load if everyone turns on uh, air conditioner or other kind of load uh, basically the fluctuation and uh, in the metering devices if they are tampered with for example uh, my question is uh, still you now somebody has to do systematic study what is the potential impact you may have done some work already but uh, i haven't seen much work the point is uh, is it going to be part of the bulk power system uh, the bulk power system what we are talking about is the uh, huge generation or uh, the critical cyber assets associated with the critical infrastructure uh, transmission system and uh, tra generation and so on not necessarily going to the distribution level or to the customer level uh, but if it is done in a bigger scale uh, then potentially it could have impact but it has to be systematically studied and what is the likelihood of that happening i heard from yesterday's discussion uh, there is a project in one of the national labs where they are collecting how many computers each person has what is the profile or usage profile what is the likelihood of these people tampering with these devices for example so basically expanding the risk model capturing multiple sources uh, but uh, as far as uh, i am concerned based on my knowledge the ami advanced metering infrastructure it provides uh, a two way communication between uh, utilities and uh, customer uh, but is it going to affect the bulk power system uh, somebody has to show the evidence uh, some study uh, but it has to be it has to happen the disruption happen really in large scale then it is indeed possible okay thank you thank you thanks michael do we have any questions from our online uh, folks not yet okay anyone else have questions Okay, I have one more question, the member. I'm going to talk about the AGC attack scenario. Okay. So, you know, I really like the analysis, the sensitivity analysis on how one can actually cause a real problem. But when you talk to people who are sort of, you know, uh, uh, operators and managing the systems, they often say they never take any one value and make a big decision. It's always information from multiple sources that they correlate and talk about it. I don't understand AGC systems very well. Maybe they do it based on just one one type of information, but we could comment on how, despite the fact that there might be multiple sources, the integrity issues are really critical because of wide area systems. That's a good point. Again, one has to have an insight about how the industry works. This is based on my understanding and a discussion with my colleagues and some other people. Uh, but the, even if the multiple sources that comes, the argument what I presented here, that argument could potentially extend it. Okay, that may be coming through some other channel of communication, for example, that could potentially be, uh, what do you say, disturbed or basically uh, some sort of data integrity violation can be created. Uh, but the good news is, yes, they rely on more information. Potentially they can mitigate. Uh, uh, but uh, if those information sources are known, one can now even go further from attack point of view, the defense can succeed. But the, this particular AGC is a simple example how this control theoretic way the system operation can be affected. I just showed you data int integrity attack, but the other one could be you now just uh, bombard the company communication channel with you know flooding, packet flooding and slow down, the information doesn't come. AGC does calculation every six seconds. If it is not done, it will compute the calculation based on stale data, which will have impact too. So, or one could have you no, know, even if you have the packets are encrypted, the data integrity attack is not possible, one can you know, uh, basically hold the packet and replay at a much later in later point in time. Again, create uh, Stable, uh, stale information which will have impact or send a fake uh, spurious packet hold the packet and keep sending the same packet again and again so all things are possible uh, but there are good mitigations possible based on the understanding and if the operators are knowledgeable about the SIP compliance and other things relying on multiple sources those are good things uh, to do let's thank our speaker again thank you very much thank you very much